Okay. All right. I think we're about ready. I'm really sorry for the uh, a slight delay to our proceedings today, but uh, welcome everyone um, to another talk uh, in our series of exclusive online talks for the Kent Archaeological Society. I hope you can all hear me okay. As ever, we are aiming to bring a wide range of fascinating subjects direct to your living rooms. And we have some excellent speakers lined up um, over the course of the rest of this year. So as you have already noticed, um, we are still figuring out all the intricacies of online offerings. But fingers crossed, it will the rest of it will run smoothly, um, but please do bear with us. So to kick off, I'm uh, just gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the talk will last for around an hour, after which there'll be time for some questions if you have any. I hope it goes without saying, but please be courteous and polite to our speaker and to each other. You can either raise, use the raise a hand feature um, and we'll unmute you. And when it's your turn, you can ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat box and we will read that out for you. If I could ask you all to please keep yourselves on mute and have your cameras off um, for the duration of the talk uh, that way we can concentrate on our speaker and hear them all without any problems um we will be recording the session and uh, with phil's permission it, it may be posted to our uh, video channels in the future but no personal data will be shared and if you ask a question but would prefer not to be published please just send me an email saying so or send any of us an email saying so and we'll make sure that is not included Okay, so on to our fantastic speaker. Philip is the Finds Liaison Officer for West Berkshire, um, dealing, uh, working for the Portable Antiquities Scheme. He has a degree in archaeology and ancient history, a master's in archaeology from the University of Reading, and is working on a PhD thesis in Rome, on Roman Richborough at the University of Kent under the supervision of Dr. Ellen Swift, Joanne Gray, Tony Wilmot, and one of our own advisory council, Dr. Steve Willis. Now, Philip has a particular interest in Roman artifact studies and ancient metrology. He's worked for Oxford Archaeology, Museum of London Archaeology and has excavated at Silchester, which I am extremely jealous about. More excitingly, I think, uh, Philip built his own home gym, partied at a Star Trek convention in Las Vegas and played cricket in year six at the Oval during the interval of Australia versus India. So there you go. Tonight, Philip's going to be reinvestigating Richborough and correcting the narrative of early antiquarian archives uh, for that important site, focusing on Richborough from AD 43 to the mid second century. His re-examination has been achieved by using up-to-date analytical and digital techniques to modernize the site archive. So without further ado, Philip, welcome. The floor is yours. I am going to turn off my camera because for some reason my normal one isn't working and it's going to uh, interfere with that. And what I'll just do is share. Now, where's the sharing gone? I'm using two screens. Uh, oh, I can't share my screen at the moment. Okay, Jacob, can you? Okay, you should uh, be able to. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, share, and I should be sharing this one. Tell me if it's if it looks good on people's screens because I've got two screens here and sometimes it doesn't quite you go. yeah that looks like it cool. it seems to be Brilliant. playing full screen so All right. All given what tonight's talk is i'm gonna yeah. see where i go with this so i've kind of got this split into two parts because everyone who's been to richborough knows richborough in any way knows it's a complex site pretty much top and tail in the end of roman britain or the beginning of an end of roman britain as we see it so i'm going to start with partly the beginning but partly the surprise from my research, which was um, the giant Quadrophon's arch um, that stood in the centre, or well, sounds would have stood in the centre at the at the port at the entrance to Britannia, and was later sort of like um, enclosed within 
the Shawfort walls and eventually demolished as part of that and come on to that to my minister as well. But the big surprise was the redating of the monument. Um, it was a bit of a shock to me. Um, it came three months before I was due to submit and I talked to Ellen Swift and I was like, have a look at this. It just thought, yeah, you can't exactly submit stuff that you know is wrong. Um, so I quickly rewrote one of my chapters, reorganised a bit and it passed in the end and I external examiner was quite excited by it so here's the results of that i'm going to present first now firstly the redating evidence the big part was um a coin of antoninus pius which was embedded inside the building material for the quadrophon's arch now the only way that could possibly happen is if the quadrophon's arch was being constructed or at least partly constructed in the coin seems to fit a 140s date. Um, so this would be approximately 50 years just gone after the original date suggested um, as a Domitianic or even slightly earlier. Um, basically, yeah, a first century arch. It doesn't really fit the narrative anymore with this piece of evidence. Um, so that's my talk. Um, has anyone got any questions? Or do we need more evidence on this? Um, the main thing here is to understand Richborough as it's as it is today, and this is as it is today. If anyone's been there, you'll see this new, um, uh, it's absolutely new gateway uh, built there, which is an absolute. It's a really fantastic piece of architecture to show off what the Claudian gateway would have looked like coming into the uh, coming into the site. Um, it doesn't really take away from the, the view of the site today. But what I'm talking about here is the Quadrophon's Arch, the cruciform platform that had lots of different interpretations, we don't really have time to go into. But then in the 1950s, based on my 60s even as well, based on Ian Richmond's notes, Donald Strong um, wrote up this Quadrophon's Arch and followed the excavator's narrative that it had to be Domitianic based on the um, excavated evidence. So this will be split into two sides, the old and the new narrative. So basically the Bush Fox narrative who excavated Richborough in the 1920s and 30s, and the new narrative, which is mine from my thesis. So it starts off with, as Richborough does, the invasion and supply base, which is a very short lived thing. No one really knows how much it was used between the invasion and then the um, uh, port town in the 1870s, which supposedly lasted with some changes and the Quadrophon's Arch through to the third century. And then what I'll come on to in the second part of this is the Triple Ditch Fortlet and the Shore Fort which follow. So the red box here is the bit I'm going to focus on with this new narrative that there is the first bit holds. There is an invasion landing there, but whether it's a supply base, given the Romans already had a foothold in Britannia from the century before, um, doesn't really track. Possible military use, maybe bivouacking in tents. There's some sites in the Netherlands which are quite similar. Um, then we come on to what I think is an imperial supply fort, fort with some um, civilian or some like the trying to think of the words for this now really, but some civilian input, some contractor input to uh, supplying the continent because really let's face it, at this stage Britannia is the breadbasket of the West. It's, it's supplying um, the continental army a lot of the time. And given a new date, we get a new port town in the 150s, which then probably lasts into the third century. So correct in this narrative, though this is the the narrative pretty much stays the same for Richborough, just with new dates. Roman invasion, construction of the arch, construction and use of the shore fort. Those are the three stages. And the image here is the old English heritage image of the arch and surrounded by buildings, which in no way have any place in the archaeology. They just weren't there. I really like their new drawing. 
Um, it's not surrounded by these buildings. It's standing on its own. It's this monumental piece of architecture that wouldn't have been crowded and cluttered by houses and businesses and all sorts around. It would have been the centerpiece of Richborough, the arch that leads into Britannia. Um, and got a copy of the chat. Uh, sorry, I thought there was something going on in the chat. In the, okay, so. Um, it was always said to be constructed in the Flavian period, possibly to, by Domitian. And this is a line from Donald Strong's report, that notorious arch build. And we know he did build a lot in Rome, so it made sense. And either seemed to, at that date, commemorate the invasion of Britannia, or which his father, Vespasian, was involved in, or the end of the Agricolan campaigns, um, and the capping off, in a sense, of the conquering of Britannia, you know, probably the propaganda that went along with that, even though there was still, um, there was still strife up in the north. So the new arch interpretation, I am 99% certain this is Antonine. Um, it could be very late Adrianic as a start if it took a while. There is one other piece of evidence that possibly puts it later towards Caracalla, but that could even be just a modification to it as well. Um, and while you could say an Antonine date would be modifications to a Domitianic arch, what I'm going to show is actually more of the construction material being associated with Antonine archaeology. Um, so as I said, in my eyes, it possibly could still be the capping off of Britannia and the building of the Antonine Wall. And you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing with things like that, with uh, the Antonine Wall being abandoned soon afterwards and the Antonine Plague is in um, the province. But it is this bigger part of a larger scheme of reorganisation in the southeast that actually has an effect on Dover as well. So this is what happened with the stratigraphy at Richborough. Bush Fox pushed all the south and century material down and I pulled it back up again. Essentially, he saw it as intrusive. I see first century as residual. Um, both are valid based on context, um, but I feel as though when it came round to it, Bush Fox did not consider residuality enough um, to the point where features were dated based on like a, we're be, being filled within a year or two of the latest date of the latest material. So if the Samian dated up to 110, um, it had to have gone in the ground very soon after that. And anyone who knows archaeology or their grandparents china collection this stuff stuck around um, it doesn't just get deposited straight away so the primary evidence and sorry for the lack of pictures in this um it's hard to get everything in as such but anyone who knows the site um, there's a group of timber stores on site built as part of the invasion demolished to make way for the arch however i looked at some of the other features around the timber stores and what features overlying them and which ones they were stratigraphically above. And it turned out that some of the road network, especially the main roads, could not have been laid down until the early AD 70s. Um, there were coins, there's at least one, two coins in the um, road metalling and in the drains that pointed towards a date at this point. And it shows that actually the end of Watling Street, right at Richborough, wasn't actually built um, as soon as they came in. And these timber stores seemed to last until the 8050s when they were demolished. Now, it was seemed that they wanted to show this quick transition from timber to stone at Richborough. There's some stone buildings as well, which replaced some of these timber stores. But if we look at some sites, particularly places like Richborough, I'm oh, sorry, not Richborough, Silchester, where you still got a timber forum, you don't have um, timber buildings being demolished really quickly. It doesn't actually make sense that they would be. Wooden structures last a lot longer unless you know, there's some disaster or they're having to be deliberately demolished. So it seems like there's actually more of a development of the wooden structures for a good 70 years rather than this immediate putting up and pulling down, which is suggested by the new data. Um, 
across the site, there are 328, if I remember my numbers right, pits and wells, all dating from the 1st to the 4th or 5th century AD. Um, right? This caused a conundrum because you don't need to know really the locations of these, but it does make sense when we look at the site as a whole. Um, the second century material was considered intrusive in these features. I've considered the first century possibly residual material. Um, what's really interesting about these pits and wells is that around the monument, there are very few of them. As you move over the road from the monument, there are a few more. And as you move right to the, basically the next set of um, insulae, which were towards, as you're heading into, heading inland, um, there's even more of them. There's absolutely loads of them. And what I think this is showing is a construction site phase, something that we kind of miss out in the narratives, sometimes of, of um, complete site overhauls, where you've got, the well pits and wells are used for working, for water, um, probably for furnaces, things like that, near the monument. Next to that, we've got more working areas, metal working, um, and some storage areas for material. And then furthest away from the actual construction site area, like you would have now on a building site, we've got the living quarters for the workers. And all these pits and wells around there are being dug by them and filled with their rubbish from living and working um, right at their job. And this is where I come on to what was concluded as the workers' houses. They are far away from the monument, um, but all of the rubbish material over the road from them uh, suggested that they were dumping this material, all material of the first and second centuries. So bush fox's evidence was they were destroyed by fire in the AD 90s, yet within the burning layer of this, there was Antonine pottery. There was Antonine Samian, so it's very dateable. Um, again, he considered that intrusive. I've considered that as if it could be residual, and, uh, well, as the first century stuff in that layer could be residual. If you're talking about workers' houses, they're not going to have all the nicest stuff. They might have some more recent um, pots and pans to use and some various um, uh, various possessions. But in a way, you want them using the old stuff because the new stuff is more expensive. So now we come to one of the key elements of this, which is the construction process of the monument. Um, the monument is made of several different materials, particularly green sand, tufa, um, uh, oolitic mortar, um, and Carrara marble. Um, again, marble chickens were associated with first century material, but rereading the archive and even the reports, the marble chickens did find their way into features with late second century material. So what we're we'll talking about is maybe these marble chippings lying around for half a century. Um, I doubt it somehow. They might have been continuing to use offcuts, but with this grand new monument, you're going to want the area, um, area clear. What was interesting is not far from the monument in a metal workshop was found a lead ingot of Nerva, which was half used. Um, it was interpreted then that this must have been used at the end of construction and then the rest discarded and deposited. Um, but it tracks that it also could be old stock. At the time of an Antonine construction, they could have still had lead ingots of Nerva around. And if anyone looks in the Roman inscription of Britain volumes, you'll see entire lead ingots of the Flavian period, Vespasian's name on them, that were completely intact. So it goes to show that these things did lie around unused for quite a while. Um, there would have been old stock of them. Now, whether a lot of these, you know exact dates for the context of them, um, but people would have found them and used them. So it doesn't, it means we could have old stock lying around. 
There is also, I mentioned on site, a series of masonry buildings. Um, so the original narrative is you've got a timber fort built just after the invasion. This lasts until the early second century when they start constructing well, constructing parts of the site, buildings around the monument in stone. So uh, late first, early second century. My new narrative would put these buildings back, uh, sorry, bring them up into the mid second century. Um, and there's the first bit of a contradiction from Bush Fox here anyway, from his rock sitter excavations. He excavated several similar houses, which he compares these masonry buildings at Richborough too. So he compares them to buildings at Roxeter. Those buildings at Roxeter, he dates to ha as Hadrianic. Um, so he's already pushing those buildings being 20, 30 years um, at the minimum after the construction of the monument. Um, he might suggest later, as quite possibly, Based on the actual contextual evidence at Richborough, these buildings are very hard to date. However, coins associated with some, or possibly associated with some, of the uh, walls and other features within suggest an earliest date of Hadriana, and given a bit of time for coins to have been circulating, um, could be into the Antonine period, or the very late Hadrianic. So there is a slight contradiction from Bush Fox right there. Now, this is the most fun part of the research because I already mentioned one contradiction. This is possibly the biggest of the lot. Um, over near the west wall, so this feature was cut by the later west shore fort wall. Um, on the near side of the photo here, this photo is taken facing northeast. Um, where the person is standing in this photo, I'm not sure who he is with the who they are with a very fashionable socks on, but um, you can see the outline of a very large pit, which seems to be stratigraphically under uh, the wall of this this room. Um, and which it is, and that's how it's described in the excavation volumes. This wall um, was interpreted as a cellar. Um, it was found to be deeper than some of the other features of the same period, uh, namely the other masonry walls, which have similar construction. Um, and given it was sunken, it was, like I say, interpreted as a cellar. Now, this feature was found um, cut into material, cut into the ground level, full, full of first and second century material. So this feature could not have been constructed until the second century. So we've got a date on it for that. Um, however, Bush Fox dated this to the late first, early second century, which again, based on the evidence of the ground level that was cut to uh, the cut for this wall, it didn't make sense. Um, the walls of this include tufa, green sand, and marble chippings, all materials that were used in the construction of the monument, but it's not of as good a construction as some of the other masonry buildings on site, which um, have similar construction materials in them. This is a bit of a, a bodge job of a, of a building. Um, it's not probably meant, obviously it doesn't have to be great. It's not meant to be seen, it's meant to be functional. But it includes material from the monument construction. So obviously using probably offcuts um, to pack it out. The pit, there in the photograph, which is being stood on, again, stratigraphically um, below the wall, was found to be filled down to the level of eight feet. I think it's a lot deeper than that, as far as I remember, 16 to 20 feet deep in total. Down to eight feet was Antonine 
material, antonine pottery. Now, this is where Bush Fox tied himself in knots to figure this out. Because how does antonine material get eight feet down in a pit under a feature, under a wall that was supposedly built in the first century? They suggested that the wall sunk into the pit and the pit was made good with material with that second century pottery in it. And I know, you know, things can be intrusive, but pottery intrusive down to eight feet in this way, just, again, it doesn't fit. Um, again, they suggested that, you know, part of the wall could have been removed and it could have been dug, but it doesn't fit that either. And basically this pit is, at, is well, filled with antonine material and the wall is built afterwards. And given the amount of material from the monument in it, in the walls, it would make sense that it's an antonine date. So as it stands with this, there's no one to, I'm afraid, smoking gun with this. There's no one piece of evidence that says, yes, this monument is 100% antonine. But every bit of evidence across the site adds up to suggest at least a late Hadrian date into an antonine bit of antonine construction or a full antonine date for the monument. Um, so as I said, I've gone through this and we include in this, the walls are built of monument material. The foundation trench for that wall has second century material in it and the antonine samian is in the pit. It's, it doesn't get any more clear cut than that. So it's a close shot picture of it, as you can see, a bit clearer. That pit is clear as day there. Um, and the archaeologist is going to spot that and understand it. So I, I think the problem was, is this came into the, this was dug in the 1930s. And they'd already come up with this idea of an, a Domitianic monument in the early 1920s, after a couple of seasons of excavation. So everything had to fit that narrative. Um, and they, again, as I say, they tie themselves in knots to figure this out. Now, I did something fun. When it came around that the Samium was one of the biggest pieces of evidence for the site, I did what any coin specialist would do. And I basically looked at the cumulative frequency of rich Le Lazoo stamps uh, against the British average. So I took this data from the online database of Samium stamps, which is recorded thousands and over hundreds of thousands of stamps from various sites across Britain and the continent. Um, and I did this against the British average. What it shows is, is as this line drops from the first or the late first century, the site as it is, is adding Samian, I'm adding Lazo Samian, at a slower rate than the British average site up until about the 140s. The reason for this is simple. It wasn't a Samian using area of the site. There's timber stores, there's no one living there, there's no major open features for rubbish deposition. Nobody is using this pottery around there. I'm not saying it's not somewhere else on the site across the island that hasn't been dug yet, but um, what the line going upwards shows is especially from the 170s where we've got a huge uptick we have samian the zoo samian being added at richborough at a much much faster rate than the british average and to me that shows a change in use of site around the 140s 150s and then straight afterwards that there's different activity going on around um, around the area of the Podrophon's Arch. And that is the change. It changes from what I say as Felixstowe into Brighton. It's a container port that turns into a seaside town. Um, there's a different character to the site, different use to that particular area of the site. Um, and that's where we get um, our change. So... The difficulty is here is how do we how do we sort this in our minds? Was this missed deliberately? 
was his evidence missed deliberately? Um, did they try and make sense of it based on other evidences they had? Um, but there are three key points here as well. The coin of Antonina Spice that I mentioned right at the beginning embedded in the elytic mortar, it was missed out of the coin lists in the published volumes. The only place I could find it was in the archive material, in the written record from the site. For some bizarre reason, there was a bunch of coins missed out, and it just happened to be these ones. There was also a Samian fragment of what was named Dragondorf 18 to 31, or 31, it definitely wasn't Dragondorf 18. Um, it was labeled as such, but then in the publication, it was re, it was um, re-identified as Dragondorf 18. And re-identifying as that fits the pre-AD 90 narrative for the art. Um, any later and it doesn't make sense. And this fragment was found embedded in some of the material. And for the life of me, I cannot find that exact fragment because of how the archive is organized, but it is there. It's going to be there. There was also more Samian in the sand levels, which were used um, to level up the area around the arch. After the foundation was poured, um, they had to level things off and they used a bunch of sand that had been dug from the foundation trench for the monument. Um, and this pottery again pointed towards a date way after a Domitianic one as well. So either we've got an Antonine, uh, Antonine arch or we've got a massive Domitianic white elephant. And it's hard to believe that stands there for 50 years completely undone and the site is a complete mess of a construction site for 50 years. There is one inscription which I'll briefly go over. Um, and this is where we, the insistence on the narrative gets interesting. Um, this inscription is a minor inscription on the arch. It seems to name Nerva and Hadrian, so it could relate to Antoninus Pius finishing a Hadrianic arch. Um, and Collingwood published this in 1926, and it just was not picked up on by anyone writing the ritual report. Um, but the important thing is, because it names a divine emperor, a definite in there, it won't relate to Domitian. Um, it just doesn't relate to it being a primary thing of a Domitian on arch. So a Hadrianic inscription or an early Antonine inscription makes complete sense. But it is very fragmented. Um, in a similar vein, Martin Hennig and Penny Coon have gone back over uh, some of the sculpture from the monument and has date, have dated these as Trajanic and Hadrianic. Again, could be additions, but you see similar sculpture in the Antonine period. And talking to Martin says, given the movement of these styles, we could see um, a uh, we could see this being used in the Antonine period in the provinces. And furthermore, from some of the material, again, the elytic mortar used um, in the arch, we've got an altar of Abundantia, uh, dated by pottery to AD 80 to 110, which for them would fit a Domitian monument. However, I found this piece of Samian from the pit above the altar, and where it was deposited, in the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. This piece of pottery seemed to find its way into a box of stuff that was sent out to, at the time, a colonial museum of re a representation of things from Britain, um, from the homeland in a sense. And this piece of Samian was dated, um, so this piece of Samian was dated into the 120s to 140s. Again, completely missed because it ended up in a completely different country. Um, but again, just another piece of evidence where these features have been misdated. I mean, in this case, by a piece of pottery completely missing. So there's a bit of context for the arch and what else was happening around at the time. We've got the construction of the Antonine Wall, um, a monument by Antoninus Pius finishing the conquest of Britannia could make sense here. We've also got the development of Dover Port. Now, there's supposed development in the Flavian period, but anyone who's read the actual report 
chose that both Richard Rees and the Samen specialist disagreed and said that the Flavian coins and pottery was residual. Um, a first attempt at constructing Dover port in the AD 130s and 140s would make sense from the evidence, and that would fit um, a movement of the fleet from Richborough down to Dover. Within the building material, there were some odd finds of lower greenstone and one piece of marble during those excavations in those layers at Dover. And I wish I could get my hands on that marble because if it's Carrara, if it's lunar marble, it could help explain about these, this, these offcuts being used as ballast in the ships, carting stuff down to Dover for the new, the new port. And there is a whole thing about we can go into on CLBR tiles, the classes botanical tiles on that, and why there are very few at Richborough and more at Dover. What I say is think recycling. So conclusion, it's a bit of a mess at Richborough. Um, Bush Fox pulled, well, pulled, but pushed down the second century until it didn't make sense. And these ideas came from the, the excavations, the very early excavations. So anything after 1924, into the 1930s until it was all written up had to be, had to fit this narrative. And the problem is, is like my PhD, dozens of sites like this need revisiting. Um, I'm sure he would have done it. I'm sure um, peers at the time would have done it. And we need to look at how they analyze the stratigraphy in a wider, um, in a wider way than just site by site and looking at and how these might be done. So that's the brief short part, first part of this. Um, what I'm going to say is, uh, would we, I think I'm going to stop sharing that screen. Um, and I'm going to move on to, if I can, if it lets me, the latter part of all of this, which is shoring up Britannia. So I've just gone from invasion supply base in 1843 and tearing that apart, um, Domitianic uh, arch at Richborough and tearing that one apart. Um, and then I think I've then got about half an hour or so, hopefully if we can keep going, uh, for the end and the Saxon shore. Um, so imagine we're at the end of the arch's life. Um, it's a bit dilapidated. You've got the third century crisis going on in the 230s, various soldier emperors trying to take control. And then we hit the Gallic Empire in the AD 260s. So I'm going to briefly look at what is the Saxon shore, but I think people from Kent are going to have a good idea about this. Look at some of the similarities and differences, and then really who built the forts and why in a short rich case study. So the Saxon shore, um, I did give the presentation in German as well a bit, so there'll still be some German bits I've forgotten to take out. Um, but it's nine or eleven coastal forts around the eastern seaboard and the south coast of, of Britain. And the traditional part is they're built either by the Gallic Empire in the 260s and um, 270s, or the Britannic Empire of Croesus and Alactus a bit later on. Um, it's hard to it's hard to say based on the evidence that was already out there, um, but these are them in all their glory, and some of them not so much. Um, Dover's one is under the building of a painted house, and other parts, Lim slid down the coast, um, and Brancaster is barely there. Brad was barely there, barring the sixth century church, and Walton Castle fell into the sea. This is how they look in um, the Notitia Dignitatum, the book of the 4th or 5th century that lists all the military installations around the empire. Um, the, this is the page for the Saxon shore, um, and it pretty much lists who was there, which military units were there, and, oh, apparently I have no slides on, but I'm sharing my Am I not sharing? Sorry. Hang on. Did I not share? Um, 
I think somebody stopped me there. Oh, I can't share again. That's why. Sorry, everyone. I didn't realize I couldn't share again. Um, here we go. I'll go back over that briefly then. Um, as I was saying, here's the list of the faults. Um, on the coastline, um, constructed by these uh, one of these two empires. Um, then we have, this is, I say, where they are now, some looking better than others. Lim, definitely in a bit of a state. Uh, I'd love to know more about the Dover one. Um, Walton Castle isn't there because it's currently, as I say, in the sea since about the 1700s, 1800s. Um, and other parts of it have gone. Uh, again, this is the Notitia page I was going to be showing. Um, shows the names of the forts and the units based on those. But don't take this as gospel as it sometimes has been. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is the main part to focus on, the chronology of the forts. Um, Brancaster, Caster and uh, Reculver all seem to be a bit earlier than most, possibly partly Severin partly early 7th, early 3rd uh, century, possibly uh, to do with the invasions into Scotland. Um, but they do have, sorry, they do have some later phases. Um, they do have some mid-3rd century phases when it's been interpreted that they've been brought into this wider um, shore fort system. Uh, the late group seems to be split a little bit. Bradwell, which were Dover, Lim, and Brancaster all seem to be lumped together as this mid to late third century. Pevensey and Porchester, based on dendrochronology at Pevensey, dating it as a lectern, and coin evidence from Porchester giving Corosian dates, suggest they were built as Corosian electon um, forts along the south coast. Burcastle and Walton Castle are a mystery. Burcastle suggests an actual Constantinian date, but that's simply because there was one massive hoard of Constantinian coins found and very little earlier. Um, so it's a bit misleading now with this one. So just to sum up, early group red, late group green, this is how they tend to be seen at the moment, um, or traditionally seen. I then used a bit of principal component analysis to analyze the faults themselves from the structural features. This came straight out of Andrew Pearson's book on the shore faults, his PhD from the early 2000s. Um, all I did was feed this into a, a piece of software that analyzes more than just two points of data at once and spits out the most likely arrangement for these. Reculver, Bradwell, Dover, and Kester all just seem to be completely all, all over the place. But Richborough, Lim, Pevensey, Portchester, and Burr Castle, very oddly Burr Castle still, all fall on exactly the same dot on the graph, suggesting their construction features, their structural features. This is the height, the width, the foundations of the wall. All of that fits that they are of the same build. And so possibly all built at the same time. I suppose that's the features. Actually, the wall dimensions a bit more show they are not on the same dot, but which reports to Pevensey and Lim are all again very well clustered. Dover, Brancaster, and Coaster are a bit closer, and Recall and Bear Castle seem to be a bit out there. But focusing on which reports to Pevensey and Lim on the south coast of Britain. All along the south coast, we know there was already an installation at Dover, and they're all of one build. That's what is being suggested by this. So in that case, who built them? Gallic Empire, Britannic Empire. To me, it's hard to say, but this is how I think of it. Both. In some way, shape, or form. Um, my new chronology of the late group splits them up a bit more. Bradwell, Lim, and Brancaster seem to be mid to late third century, but Lim, I'm starting to think, is probably that bit later, maybe even into the cause and election period. Dover 
construction feature wise and from coin evidence is suggesting a date in the 270s to 280s and this is similar to Cardiff Castle. There's a fort under Cardiff Castle which seems to have this date and similar construction features to Dover and I've got a funny feeling this is when the province is brought back um, under continental control after the Gallic Empire but before the Britannic Empire this is them shoring up their ports, Dover and Cardiff being two main ones. And what I'm going to come to as the case study is some coercing and Lacton evidence at Richborough and Burr Castle and Walton Castle can't really be worked out on the evidence at the moment. So this is how it goes. Um, early group redeveloped by the Gallic Empire in the 260s. Their installations are already there, some of them from the Severan period. Um, and they're useful to the Gallic Empire. They also don't need to be a line of defence. They're not on their front line. Their front line is over in Gaul. Um, there's no need for them to build new forts around the coast of Britain. I'm calling the awkward middle group is Dover Fort and the Shore Fort. Um, seems to be the Serranian posthumous again links to Cardiff Castle now, um, which could be interesting to investigate further. And then what I've got is this late, late group, Richborough, Lim, Pevensey and Porchester, built by Corosius and Alexis along the south coast. And the late, late group, maybe a couple of additions. So really it's the two, story of two invasions. A failed invasion by Maximian, which um, comes to us down through the Panjarics, a group of speeches given to the emperor. Basically, Maximian, tries to kick Electus, a uh, kick Carosius out of Britannia, um, coming from the east, from the Rhine, but gets knocked back by storms. Um, and if you'll note from talking earlier, we've got some of the, uh, we've got at least one, Reculver and early for maybe Bradwell and Walton Castle, depending on Dayton there as well. Um, but at this time, from an eastern attack, we don't have Richborough, Lim, Pevensey and Porchester in place. Then, as the story goes, Electus murders Carothius um, and takes over. And then Electus is finally kicked out um, by Constantius Chlorus. Invasion is noted at being near Richborough, or at Richborough and near Southampton. So, kind of a fork down towards Porchester Way, Isle of Wight, um, and another attack coming at Richborough and completely circumventing these. Um, seven forts. So Andrew Pearson, while I was doing his PhD, wrote an article um, about the completion of the forts um, because he was noticing different phases of construction. Um, and he wrote this one sentence towards the end after going through people, hour used, um, yeah, so people, hours, all the supplies that would have been needed, um, the, uh, all of the uh, building material, he wrote, the issue, of, the issue of completion is particularly sensitive. Much of the discussion in this paper would become irrelevant if the reforts remained um, unfinished at the termination of Electus's reign. I latched onto this quote and ran with that, given the evidence I'd seen from his PhD research to see what would happen. Um, and I found this. Mid to late century Fort Lip, pointed out there, built around the old foundation of the Quadrifon's Arch, whether that was still standing or not, who really knows. A late third century fort, occupied during the fourth century and abandoned in the fifth. That's the simple version. However, the Fort Lip can now potentially be dated to the 290s um, AD, the AD 290s. This so this is this fort that goes around, kind of respects this second century building, possibly used as a headquarters building by whoever built or had this fort lit constructed around second century monumental arch. Um, that's because what was again missed was Corosian coins in the very bottom of these ditches. Now again, we've got intrusiveness going on, but these ditches are nine feet deep. Um, 
These Crossian coins were found at the very bottom of some of these ditches. And there wasn't just one of them, there was a handful. So we're looking at ditches that could have been constructed earlier, but couldn't have been filled until the AD 290s at the earliest. Um, we then have a section of fallen masonry over in the northeast corner. And if anyone's been to Richborough and sees where this would have joined up and wonders why they didn't find it, that's because after the excavations or during the excavations in the 20s and 30s, the ground layer was raised because they were dumping all of their spoil over the scar, um, which raised the ground level, which made a false ground level around the foundations of the monument. Um, Self and Tony Wilmot looked at this a little, um, and he was trying to uh, work out in his mind how this masonry, given the angle it fell at and the angle it landed at, could have fallen all of this way across. We're talking a good 50 metres. It didn't make any sense. Um, it was suggested during the early excavations that there had to be another wall further out, and this eastern wall here was never actually built. Um, but the more important thing here is underneath the main north wall in this corner, was with a question mark with it, as a coin of Carausius, then underneath the wall, which also parallels with Carausian coin evidence in the walls at Portchester. So this, again, could start to add a construction of the north wall or the wall, at least one of the walls. We do this thought that the eastern ditches, which are now over the edge of the cliff, um, one of them was used as the foundation trench for the east wall. So it sat in that trench. So whoever filled these ditches in built the wall. But what was even more interesting is in the bottom of these ditches as well, were coins of Constantine the first. Now I'm not sure how coins of the three twenty three twenties and three teens get in the bottom of ditches that seem to have been filled in the AD two nineties, but I do have a suggestion that goes back to Andrew Pearson's quote of what if the forts weren't finished? Then if we look, there was um where this great black circle is a very thin layer of mortar, um, and it was very similar to the material used in the fort walls over that side in the Westgate area, um, which I'll come on to as well a little. In this mortar floor, again, a question mark by it, but weathered out of this concrete floor was a coin of the House of Constantine. So if this evidence, along with the Constantinian coins in the triple ditches held, we'd be looking at construction material at the time of um, Constantine the first um, into the mid fourth century. We then have even further evidence of potential Constantinian construction on some of the wall areas. Um, coins were found in a couple of lime kilns which were outside of the fort walls to the northwest, um, near some of the fallen masonry there. Um, within these, there were coins of Carosius, but there were coins of the House of Constantine. Again, solidly in this case, in um, features used um, for the uh, construction of this area. This area. What's interesting is the lime kilns. They could have used the mar some of the marble from the monument or was lying around afterwards as part of this. And Andrew Pearson pointed out that the only place the material from the Quadrophon's arch was used at Richborough in the shore fort walls was the north wall, which had a con different construction style to the east, west, and south east, west, and south walls. And there was also material from the Quadrophon's arch in the west gate, close to that mixing floor, with the weathered out coin of the House of Constantine. So a new timeline, it could exist of 
redevelopment of existing forts, which are on the Culver and the others up the eastern seaboard as the early group. Dover, and now what I believe is Cardiff, as this middle group, recapturing Britannia for the empire. A reoccupation of the existing forts again by the Britannic Empire, where it was not their front line. That was still in Gaul at this time. Um, and then a construction of the southern forts, Richborough, the Culver, um, sorry, Richborough, Porchester, Pevensey, and Lim, as part of a defensive line against an invasion from Constantius Chlorus, which didn't happen. Then why I suggest is there's a lull in settlement. I suggest that Electors failed in his attempt to finish these forts before an invasion happened. He is also building a building in London, a huge one, Mint Palace, you know, nightclub, whatever anyone wants to interpret it as. Nobody really knows, but he, a lot of resources would have gone into this building in London. There's a lull in settlement um, at this stage, and it picks up again in the AD 340s. There is potential coming evidence from the amphitheatre excavations, which I was part of, which could suggest that as well. We do see a similar gap, um, another point far removed from where the excavation went in, went on inside the fort. So into the fourth century, we possibly have a new timeline here of a reoccupation and completion of the fort under the House of Constantine, um, which then lasts into the fifth century. Um, not part of this talk, because it would be a whole other talk. There's possibly a reorganization of internal features in the 380s and 390s. Um, under Magnus Maximus and removing the legions from Britain and then the reoccupation until the supposed letter in AD 410. Um, but it's this main bit I want to draw attention to that Andrew was, Pearson was possibly slightly right about this, about electors not having completed them, because it looks like they were still being made or made good in the mid-5th century, or sorry, mid-4th uh, century. This leaves the conundrum of Walton Castle and Burr Castle in the east as well. Why nine of 11? Why were there only nine forts listed in the Notitia Dignitatum and not all 11? What I suggest is that these could be added later. They're missed off an AD 340s, 350s list when it seems like this position of the Count of the Saxon Shore is brought in. Um, and then further forts are added um, at a later point. Um, if there was, because at Richborough, it's listed that the Second Legion was present. Um, the Second Legion seems to be a detachment, possibly from the 340s and 350s, and there only seems to be one unit per fort listed. Um, however, we get a mix of material, both continental and insular. Into the types of uh, strapend over on the left here, these supposed nail cleaner strapends seem to be a product of Western Britannia from part of my um, typology study of these. And the one on the right, or sorry, the one on the left, actually, the amphora, traditional amphora shaped ones, seem to be more of a, a continental one. In mainland Britain, these rarely mix. But at Richborough, there's 30 odd of these, and there's a wide mix of the styles. So it might suggest. The Legion brought these new styles with them to Richborough um, from the West in the fourth century while mixing with continental troops um, who were using this style that was known to them or continental troops coming later on. So there isn't only one unit at Richborough. Um, I have identified a potential cavalry unit there as well, um, very late in the fourth century, possibly replacing the legion or working side by side with them. But we don't know what this means for other forts. We're assuming one fort per, um, one legion per fort, one unit per fort, but that might not be the case. But what's interesting is how the forts and local towns were garrisoned. If you look at the material, um, this late military material from Richborough, 
um, you'll see it is typologically similar to Portchester and the graves at around Winchester and at Lankhills. However, the material, the military material of the fourth century is type typologically dissimilar to that at Reculver. Um, that seems to be because Reculver is garrisoned by a unit that's been in Britain since um, the Hadrianic period. So as the crow flies, Reculver is much, much closer than Portchester, but is culturally very different. So these forts are being garrisoned by different units being brought from different places at different times. Um, and the material is quite similar to the local town. But I'm really surprised if you look back through Canterbury's archaeology and found similarities between the Richborough and Canterbury material, but maybe not so much a recolder. Portchester and Winchester are the same, and I'm sure it would track for the other forts. It definitely does, um, possibly for Colchester and for Caister as well. So conclusions. We always talk of a Saxon shore fort system, but this is not a system until the AD 340s, as we see a unified system of all the forts. The forts are built at different times for different purposes by different people and are utilised in different ways, whether they're already standing or need rebuilding. So we see British coastal forts built during the third century, possibly for defensive use, but it's, un, um, it's not their only use. So as I say, different people, different times, different purposes, depending on circumstance. Gallic Empire are reusing them maybe for supply, Carosius maybe, and Lactus maybe for defence, and Constantine again maybe to reorganise the supply of Britannia to the continent. Um, let's say, from both of these short talks though, Richborough is not simple. Um, it needs re-looking at in much more detail than I did in my PhD. There's at least another five, six or seven PhDs in that material as it is. Um, and if anyone knows of any, any place that would give me a huge, huge grant to be able to sort it all out, please let me know because I don't think it's going to be done in my lifetime or the next. Um, there's just too much and it was never organised well in the 1920s and 30s to start with, and it'd be a huge task to redo it. Um, so that's rich for from end to end. I have gone in just under an hour, but I was a bit late. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, again, there's much more than I could say for an hour, really. Um, what I'll do is... I'll put that on and I'll try and face the camera while listening and reading to questions. So, Philip, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you so much for that, that fascinating talk. That was brilliant. And uh, we certainly. Yeah, saw... apparently some of it disappeared again. I don't know why. It That's might be I... for some people because of the orientation of my screens. You can see I've got two screens in there. <laughs> That's okay. I, I can see you now. Are you, are you, yeah. you all good? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank the Thank you. 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 Thank and I think one of the interesting things for me is um, in a time when there's a lot of discussions about disposal of archives. Yeah. Uh, you know, this life. is this is really important showing why we shouldn't be getting rid of uh, these archives, yeah. because actually there's still a lot we can learn from them. And, um, you know, they weren't always as accurate as mm. you know, the fight. It's not never final, I suppose, you know. Mm. It also goes to show, while archaeologists need to, and this is going to be controversial, stop digging so many holes. <laughs> Construction, get, commercial archaeology gets a pass because of the laws, but post X from a century gone needs a lot of research. And like I say, we did that dig 
um, the amphitheatre at Richborough, and that's just added a load more material to a site that has a lot of material that needs analysing. Sure. Um, it, there are, how do we, we rationalise the collection like that? So um, we've got time for a few questions now. Um, if you want to raise your hand it's in the reactions button or if you want to ask via the chat please type it in i've got um a few already so i'm just going to shout them out yeah, to I'm you gonna try and make the chat bigger for myself so i can see what's going on okay cool so it. the first one from steve smith um i don't know if it's too late now but if you could just explain the uh intrusive and residual terms and maybe the difference yeah in the... so essentially the pits from top to bottom, let's say we've got one of the pits, rubbish pits at 16 feet deep or so. Logic says you'll find material, if it's gradually silted and filled up, weathered in, deliberately filled, you're going to find the earliest material at the bottom and latest material at the top. So in this case, first century near the bottom, second century near the top. Um, the idea in Bush Fox's mind was that... Um, if there was a lot of first century material in the pit and a few bits of second century, um, then that meant a few bits of second century had to have entered the top of the pit after it was filled. It was filled completely with first century and the few bits of second just sink into the top of a fill. Old pit is a more recent, well, I'd say recent view, it's only like the last 70 years or so, even, um, is that the pits filled up over time, um, or even if they were filled in in one go, those few bits are the few bits that exist um, um, at, that, at that time. So, first century, like I said, imagine your, your grandmother's china, which is 100 years old. Um, if that all gets smashed up, hundred years after it was made um, and thrown in the rubbish. It might get thrown in the rubbish with a few of the bits from today. Um, if that's the case, that first century that your grandmother's china has gone in long after it was made. So it's residual, it's lasted. Um, and it's lasted in, from one century to the next. And that's why I'm saying this happened with the first century material. It hasn't gone in soon after the last piece was made. It's gone in 10, 20, 30, 40 years after it was made. And the few bits of second century are the contemporaneous few bits and pieces that are added in when the features capped off. That sort of makes sense. Um, basically, they're using they're using old mm -hmm. stock. And people, you know, you don't just throw your plates away, you know. I mean, you might do if you, you know, merge in two households when you move in with somebody. Um, but again, you would have had those few years. So, could have been from any time. Thank you. Okay, uh, a question from Mark Willingale. It says, I've been looking at the orientation of the arch, which appears to be close to 106.26 degrees, which is 16.26 degrees south of east, which is exactly the same as the long line of sight orthodrome for Watling Street from Stangate to the crossing of the Great Stour near Bigbury and is yeah. the and is the angle subtended by a 724-25 Pythagorean triangle south of east. Has there been any investigation and debate on the orientation of the arch? Short answer is absolutely none whatsoever. Um <laughs> The reason being is because, and I should have put some pictures in some of my slides there, the orientation of Watling Street changes. Um, the line of it changes. There's an earlier road than the arch, and then it shifts. So Watling Street, as was um, before the Shawfort walls, um, is under part of one of the part of the west gate of the Shawfort. And that gate is on the line of the Quadrophon's arch. The Quadrophon's arch is not on the first century alignment. Um, so they even change it within the second century. And I tell you a point there, there could have been some deliberate reasoning for that. I don't know if that's because of the orientation where the ships would have 
come into Richborough, whether it's the alignment aligning it to the road from the harbour. Does that need more investigation? Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is some purpose to the orientation as it is. Um, and when you say the orientation as it is, is that magnetic north or true north? Because we know magnetic north changed basically on how we found the uh, the amphitheatre walls. Um, obviously, we know Romans did this kind of stuff. We know they were deliberate. And one part they were deliberate in, and this was brilliant, um, Tony Wilmot was giving a talk on the, um, the amphitheatre. And it was, oh, the other Tony. I can't remember which one. Um, pointed out, asked basically in the chat, um, is the amphitheatre built on the alignment of the solstice? And I quickly pulled up a sun um, tracker on my computer, put in the solstice, and lo and behold, first thing in the morning, the sun shines right into the entrance of the amphitheatre. Oh, interesting. And I was like, how on earth did we not notice that when we were digging? How did no one think to check that one? Oh. So they were yeah. doing this stuff around them. I mean, throughout the empire, you see this. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was some deliberate reasoning for it, because the alignment of Watling Street changes between the first and second century. It's not much, but it does. And you can see it when you go there. Look at the alignment of the cross on the platform to the new gateway that's built, and they are off. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't know. This is an actual question or maybe an offer for something for you here. Uh, it's yeah. from M. Stevenson. It says, some samium from Richborough was given to St. Joseph's Convent School in Chatham. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know when. When the school yeah. was closed down in the 1970s, I ended up with this material. I took some of the more complete pieces back to Richborough and gave them back to their surprise and confusion. <laughs> but I think I may still have some of the smaller bits. I'm not sure. Uh, there being a box I haven't looked at for years. Contact me if there might be any point of it for you. So there you go. There's yeah. some if secret they, if, you've got some, if they've got writing on them, I'll take them. Um, oh. Because not all the bits of pottery are marked up with their context. Um, so um, perhaps what we'll do is we will circulate yeah. your work email later to our yeah, members. Definitely. And then um, they can get in touch with you and you can yeah. discuss that. Um Tim Colk has asked, does your research impact our understanding of when the amphitheatre was built? Quite possibly, and this will actually feed into the CLBR tile question, so I'm going to tackle both of those at the moment. So, evidence from the site, and I can't completely confirm this because I'm waiting to hear from Tony about some of the, what they've been doing with the material, suggests a date after the AD 70s for the amphitheater. But that is very scant evidence. And the problem with amphitheaters are they were public buildings that were cleaned regularly. So you're not going to find a lot of material in them. No amphitheater excavation finds a lot of material. Outside of them, loads. There was a key difference between the inside and out, not the construction of the amphitheater, but when it was stopped being used. Inside the amphitheater or the final, um, the final um, deposits in the amphitheater suggested there were coins, mostly the radiate period and some early Constantinian. Outside the amphitheater, there was nothing earlier than the 340s. And that ending part fits nicely with what I said about new Constantinian occupation and potentially a different use for the amphitheater afterwards. Early amphitheater, difficult to say. Possibly we didn't get any first century coins and the only first century coin is one of Domitian known from the Victorian excavations. But I'm putting my money on an AD 70s, um, an AD 70s build date. And what we have done is I talk, I bumped into one of the specialists uh, working on the pottery and the building material from that excavation. And I said, recommend any um any tile any ceramic tile that we got samples from the walls that was in situ to, to test him for the material 
for sale the R fabric. I would not be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a, if it's a military bill. Um, now, and I think in the same way, it's a bit like London. You've got this early activity, maybe some official military, etc., and then it attracts people around. Now, going on to the CLBR tile, um, this is interesting. Why do we not have a lot at Richborough, um, but we do from other places? Um, I keep looking back at the map of supposed CLBR tile sites across Kent and across Sussex, and they're all inland. I would not be surprised if people were buying up job lots of old tile to use. Now, if my hypothesis is correct, that is, Richborough was the base for the Classis Britannica, but wasn't raised until the late first century BC because the main fleet in the channel was um, the Germanica. It wasn't the British fleet. Um, then they could have moved a lot of material from Richborough to be used at Dover. The dates could possibly line up. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, but it, may, it is weird that we only have a handful of tiles at Richborough which seems to then be earlier, but why are they all? There's so many at Dover, so many stamps. Um, like I said, I'd love to get hold of the building material from that archive and check the bits of marble that we found to see if they match the building material for the monument as well. Um, we would have to see, but the point being is that you have to go back and start looking at the Classis Britannica because there's the famous Claudian dated um, naval soldiers tombstone at Boulogne and everyone places it's Claudian and he's a member of the British fleet it doesn't say that on the tombstone but it's a repeated thing that nobody goes back and looks at it he's just a member of the fleet and if that's the German fleet that was already being raised possibly by Caligula possibly used by Caligula ready to invade Britain then why wouldn't Claudius make use of it? Why raise a whole other fleet? We have to look at the Botanica, Classis Botanica again um, and look more in depth at these, um, the tile material. That sounds like a, an interesting project. Another interesting project that... Um, we yeah, there's to... another PhD again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need more funding for PhDs, I feel, is what we're, yeah. we're getting. From all of this um so that was the uh question from gordon there you kind of covered that and the, the tiles mm. so we've got a last question here from mark samuel it says have you tried to see how the long long citadel uh, fits with your plan yeah. um fits with your plan comparisons this seems to be a saxon sure thought but in the wrong place like cardiff is it parochial to think only of a specific British organisation. Uh, it really yeah. is. Um, the reason being is because if, you, if you're talking about that period, because Boulogne was there from the first century, it was seemingly used as a point for the invasion, whether it was the main um, disembarking point and such. Um, if we're talking about the Shawfort period, it makes total sense. And a colleague in the continent, uh, well to do, has done a lot on the continental forts. If you're rebuilding, if you're building any forts like Richborough and the southern forts or even the eastern ones, you need somewhere you're going to. And there are similar dates to forts along the French and Belgian, Belgian coasts. So because both empires, Gallic and Britannic, they did control, their front line was in Gaul, they control that coast. They're going to be building on both sides and the dates do line up quite nicely. The only problem we have is, and I tried getting this together, but there was a lot of reasons it never came together, is to talk to the people who have been working on these forts on the continent. And we need this cross-continent connection even more now because they haven't got access to our material and we haven't got access to theirs. 
So when he wrote his book on these, he was writing at the same time as I was doing Richborough, and we could have swapped a lot of notes. Um, Because my redating came out after his book was published, or like months after his book was published. So we really could have um, worked together on that. But yeah, there is definitely um, a lot going on there. And on that last one, I am uh, <clears throat> I am interested in that horde as well that's come up recently, as well as what Simon and others and Sam Moorhead, they're interested in lemmas, because, again, we need to revisit those, and Lim is a really good contender. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, there's a, there's a lot around Richborough. That's the problem. The focus has always been on the fort which only makes up 11% or 10, 11% of the entire occupied area of Rich Island. Now, anyone who does archaeology knows, you know, when you go into a site, you're probably doing a 10% sample. But if your 10% sample is that one area, you haven't got the site. Yeah. So, sorry, this is my sleepy daughter who's just coming. She should be in bed right now. Um, (laughs) Anyway, I think... um, I am gonna let you uh, let you get off now. That um, yeah, yeah and sorry thank you. Late, so, no, 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 no. Thank, thank you so so much. Um, any cool. other questions? We will forward over to you, and hopefully, cool. you know, we can sort any answers. Unless you know, there's anything else you wanted to add before you? No, but I had just read about. I had heard about stuff going on down at Dover, and reading that, and <laughs> like, oh, if there is material there. Uh, <laughs> There you I go. Think Keith Parker knows I'm interested in that lump of marble. Um, this is the thing so with you. Maybe when you there. do a PhD on it, you end up being sent <laughs> don't need the... another one. Yeah, but that's stressful <laughs> um, enough. Cool. What I do is I'll send over the slides as well. If you want to match them up with talk and such. And, yeah, fantastic. And, and um, if it's okay with you, we will put this up on our YouTube channel in a, f- a future date. If that's okay sure. with you. Yeah. Um. Yeah, thank you so much, thank Phil. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Fascinating talk. Mm-hmm. And obviously, there's still lots of work um available down there in Richborough and the whole Kent coast. It seems. It really um, is. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, it's been a, another wonderful talk. Sorry about some of our little technical issues there we are still learning and we're getting there and i'm sure we will have it all smoothed out by the end of the year i hope speaking of which we have upcoming talks now um note that the talk that is on our website for the thursday the 26th has had to be changed we will have a speaker for that week but the details are to be confirmed and the talk that andrew mayfield was going to give us about randall manor revealed community archaeology excavations in Sean Woods Country Park, um, we will be rescheduling that as well. So we will get those details to you very soon. Uh, Thursday, the 24th of October, we have Diving with a Purpose, the SSTR Thompson Project, given by Tad Tabara. And on Thursday, the 14th of November, we have Septemius Severus uh, online talk with Dr. Simon Elliott. Um, and... Yes, we will have more going on into next year. Um, And if you are not yet a member, please do consider joining us. Uh, You know, our memberships, they keep us alive. They're what you guys are, who we do it all for. So um, this allows us to get more things out about the history and heritage of Kent and continue to publicise and promote and to have fantastic talks by people like Philip. Um, Thank you all very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. All right, guys. Have a lovely evening. Thanks again for looking, uh, for, for sticking with us. And uh, we'll see you soon.